Take a moment and reflect on the relationship you have with yourself. Do you feel connected to or disconnected from yourself? How do you connect with your inner self? Welcome to Normalize the Conversation. I'm your host, Francesca Reigeter, and today I'm joined by sound therapist, meditation teacher, and author, Sarah Oster. Join us as Sarah explores the importance of building a deeper connection to yourself and shares tools like sound healing to help you nurture that connection. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited for our conversation, but before we jump in, I really just want to check in. How are you really? When you ask me, how am I really, what do you mean by that, Fran? I mean, how are you really? Not just a superficial greeting, but how are you doing? How are you feeling? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I am feeling pretty steady these days pretty hopeful. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty inspired actually by the opportunities that I have in my work. Um, and I'm lucky that I get to make my own schedule and things like that. So I feel I'm feeling pretty balanced these days. I think one lesson that I actually took from the pandemic is to create more, even more space for rest. Uh, and so my life is actually feeling pretty balanced right now. I'm feeling pretty good in my body and yeah, I'm feeling pretty happy to be here talking to you. I love all of that for you so much. I, I know for me, I tend to overwhelm myself and put too much on my plate and not make time for rest until it's been like three days and I'm stuck in bed, can't get up because I've just hit a like wall of pure exhaustion where I'm sleeping like 12 hours, waking up for an hour to eat and then going back to bed. So to hear that you've cultivated a space where you allow yourself to rest and I've created this balance is beyond inspiring to me. I need to get there. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I am certainly over the, the the busy hustle culture. I I have been. Maybe I'm a little ahead of that that curve, because I need to practice what I preach. I feel like in my in my work, and I think it's the case for for a lot of people actually that we're living in a constant state of reactivity always from the moment our alarm goes off in the morning and all the alerts from our emails and social media and text messages is coming in and we're just being required to be reactive and responsive every moment of the day until we think that we're sitting on the couch watching tv relaxing but even watching tv is stimulating uh, and then if we're lucky, then we crash out into unconscious sleep. Uh, however, there's not much emphasis throughout many people's days uh, around just taking pause and taking moments to rest in between things, to reset, to access clarity before moving on to the next task. Oh my goodness, yes. I'm so tired of this world where my focus is on creating content all the time and just how much I can produce, right? And that's so true. My phone is like glued to my hand 24-7 because I'm so like stressed about missing an email or a phone call. I mean, I answered a phone call for work at like 9.30 last night. While I was in class, I like turned off my camera, muted my mic and answered a call. I never give myself that space to just exist. It's like I'm constantly looking for my worth and value and how much I can produce instead of, and how much I've done so far. Yeah, I think I've been quietly asking this question to, I don't know, the collective is like, are you content making content? Because... <laughs> It seems pretty anxiety producing. And I would love to just give you an example of a, of a sound bath experience that I facilitated just this last weekend 
uh, for a brand for New York Fashion Week and everybody in attendance was uh, a, a quote unquote influencer, um, media person. And I could feel the real difference in, in the room, uh, everybody kind of in their phones, nobody really interacting with each other, everybody focused on trying to, to capture the moment. And so I made a request and I said, you know, I'm going to pose as if I'm in the middle of facilitating. And why don't you guys all take out your phones and you can take as many pictures of me as you want for the next couple of minutes. So you have proof that you were here and you get your content. I know they need that, that's their job. And, and then let's make a deal. You put your phones away and then be here and have the experience. And they all agreed to it. And we did it and we all had a laugh about it because <laughs> I then just made some funny poses just for a giggle. And uh, yeah, and then they put their phones away and, and actually had a, had a deep and meaningful experience. Yeah. I love that. It's so important that we learn to just disconnect from our phones, from social media. I mean, you know, growing up, they're like, oh, how many followers you have doesn't matter. No one cares about how many likes you have. But it seems like our society has really cultivated this desire to have a high following because that's how you get more opportunities, more brands to work with you, even PR teams to sign you, getting more podcast listeners. The more followers you have, the more visibility and exposure you have. So our society has really become all about posting and taking photos where we are, showcasing where we are, and not giving ourselves the chance to live in the moment. I know me and my friends are at brunch the other day, and we're like so worried about taking photos. I'm like, this is so silly. Can we just enjoy our food? We can't because we're so like consumed with this idea that we need to be posting to exist instead of we need to just exist as we are. Yeah, and I actually, I think there can be a happy medium. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly, I'm not anti-phone, I'm not anti-social media. It's actually social media is a way that I'm able to travel all around the world. It's a way that I've connected to an international audience. And so that's really incredible. The ability of those sort of channels that are available to us now, where we can have interesting conversations and reach new audience and make new connections is really beautiful. Uh, however, I do feel strongly that there needs to be more emphasis around, you know, actually being steeped in experience, uh, giving yourself the time to become wise in a particular field of, of interest. I think the uh, ability to have information at our fingertips has given people a false sense of knowing because if, if you have a question, oh, you can just type it in and you get a bunch of answers and you say, oh, I'm now I'm an expert on this topic. Uh, and so what I think is what I fear for, actually, I should say, if we're talking about how I feel really, friend, what I fear is that this um, commitment to education, to learning, to studentship uh, is becoming, becoming lost because of how fast everything is accessible. Yes, absolutely. When all the information in the world is really available at our fingertips, it's so difficult. But one thing a lot of us often don't realize is what comes up first is a result of SEOs. It's a result of SEOs. It's not a result of being completely factual all the time. So keeping in mind when we are scrolling, I mean, informational support and research so important absolutely being aware is important but also recognizing that the first source that comes up may not make you an expert because it may not even be correct so taking the time to research where the information is coming from and making sure that you're actually getting valuable information instead of just trying to consume whatever comes up first and 
psychologically, uh, physiologically, we are, as humans, we're not designed to be able to receive all of the suffering of the whole world. And with the, <laughs> with the ability to access all current events from all over the world and every news story that comes up, it can actually, it can feel really overwhelming, especially if you're a sensitive person, because you might want to feel like you might feel like you want to help. Um, you might feel like helpless, like there's nothing you can do about it. And so I do think that it's important to make choices around what you're exposing yourself to. Oh my goodness. Absolutely. Yes. I know. So one thing my grandma loves to do is keep the news on in the background at all times. And I can't, I, I love her so much and I'll just go and mute it because like, it's so great to be informed, but we're hearing the same thing over and over again. It's the same news cycle 10,000 times a day. And it's so like pressing. There's so much bad happening in the world. And to constantly be taking that in and only that in, then she's lying on the couch all depressed and so sad. And I'm like, we got to watch some comedy. Like, let's put on Friends or the Big Bang Theory, just something to make you laugh and not have to feel the weight of the world and everything bad on your shoulders. But a lot of times we don't realize that how much that information, how much hearing all about the bad things all the time is really influencing the way we feel. Mm, yeah. And, and that sometimes you might feel, uh, just an underlying feeling of sadness or anxiety. You can't put your finger on it, but it's coming from just this being, being open to receive all of this all of this information and being asked to process it, have a quick opinion about it, um, especially through social media, if there's a, a, a current event or a disaster or a, something political that comes up that you might feel an urgency to react or respond very quickly when in fact, I do believe that it's much more responsible to, to take a pause, to sit with your feelings, to be able to have the space for reflection, right? And so when somebody asks you, how are you feeling really? It's okay to take a breath and think about it. Yeah. For a minute and you don't have to put pressure on yourself to say, oh, I, I better answer quickly. <laughs> just say the first thing that comes to my mind. Uh, but just giving yourself permission to take to take pauses to to process. Yes, I that was something I really struggled to learn because I just wanted to. I mean, it goes back to that like hustle culture where it's constantly moving and doing things. And I never took a time to pause, take in what was happening, figure out what I understand, what I don't understand, what questions I should be asking, what, how I can help, how I can make a difference, how I can just exist, how I can do anything or how I'm feeling. I never would take a pause to just take it all in and figure things out. I was so determined to just respond and respond and respond that I never sat with any of those feelings and never had the chance to process them. So I couldn't cope with any of them as well. So it just became this like going down the rabbit hole of my mental health. So enter sound baths and meditation and why they are gaining popularity in the mainstream, it, it really, the, the practice of, of sitting, uh, and, and getting really quiet is it's nothing new, but we are in need of it now more than ever because of 
the hole <laughs> that exists there where, where we we aren't we aren't stopping to reflect you know you just used to be built in um you had to you know wait to get your newspaper in the morning so you can i don't i don't really you know i don't remember too well the days before the internet but i was alive <laughs> and you know, there, there used to be pauses built into life just because things took a little bit more time. And now because of the quickness of life and information and news cycles and all of that, uh, there aren't really built in moments to, to, to stop and reflect. And so a sound bath experience um, gives people permission to take a pause, to put the phone down, to get quiet, to close their eyes, and just to be reflective for whatever it is, five minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, you know, as long as, as you can handle it and, and, see, and see what comes up and just be with what is, which nowadays is a sort of a, a novel uh, concept, but really important that we're giving ourselves that space. Yes. Exactly. And one thing I really love about it is like, I, I feel like the vibrations inside of me, like in different areas, and it gives me a chance to understand where I'm feeling things. My friends and I um, used to listen to like sound baths on YouTube, and then we bought um, sound bowls and we're trying to do it. We're not good at it at all. We can't figure out how to do it well. So we're going to pretend like that's not a thing for us but we kept trying and we just loved the way we could feel like a vibration in our chest or in our throats or just somewhere and be able to sit with that and recognize that maybe I've been afraid to like speak up or say something or maybe I've been afraid to allow myself to feel and closing myself off so it really helped us explore what we were afraid of and like blocking ourselves from mm, I, I love it it's so beautiful that you're exploring that with your friends too and and what you what you hit on is really powerful because what you're invited to do in a sound bath is to explore and and sense subtlety something as subtle and ephemeral as vibration where you feel it in your body, how is it affecting you? And you get to have these really rich communications and conversations with yourself. And so it becomes a very deep experience of self-inquiry that is also gentle, you know, not where you're aggressively drilling yourself with, with questions or putting any kind of pressure on yourself, but, but just letting yourself be still enough to allow answers and observations to reveal themselves. Yes, and I think that for me at least, I was never taught how to explore or listen to myself or understand myself. I was kind of taught the stereotypical of what a female should be, what a cheerleader should be, what a good girl should be, just like all these little things that who I should be and never giving myself a chance to just ask who I am and what I'm feeling and explore what I'm afraid of, what I'm holding myself back from. I never had a chance to just really self-reflect. And then when I did, a lot of times it was in therapy, and I'm a huge advocate for therapy. I love therapy. However, sometimes I felt overwhelming being asked questions like directly, and not like coming up with them with myself and sitting with myself. I kind of felt maybe a little pressure to have an answer and felt so like ashamed to not have an answer for my therapist. So with the sound baths, one thing that I love is it just gave me a chance to, I wasn't like, I didn't expect to have like any kind of vibration or self-discovery, but it just kind of came out of nowhere and brought so much benefit into understanding myself in a different way. Yeah, and I really feel that sometimes that's all it takes is giving some space around something 
uh, whether it's something challenging that's going on with you mentally or physically, um, you know, instead of aggressively poking at it or picking at it to just kind of sit back and observe it and let it do what it does and, and, and listen. That's really what it is. Um, what you're being asked to do in a sound bath is to is to listen, listen to the sounds that are being played into the room, and listen to what's coming up for you. And when I facilitate, I always say it's everybody's experience of sound is unique to them. So that if there are sounds that come up in the experience, and you think. Ooh, I, I felt this in my chest. Is that, is that normal? Or my leg just twitched a little bit. Does that happen to everyone? Or I, I just started crying out of nowhere. Like, is that what's supposed to happen in a sound bath? I, I've, I've heard it all. I've been doing this for a long time and a lot of different things can come up for people. And that's because they're giving space around themselves to let things it's almost like a like a sifting of, of sorts a, a a re uh arranging a configuration of what what's going on and it allows you to kind of take a step back and and get a different perspective on what's going on when you've never really had that space to take that step back it can feel a little like out of body experience that's how i would describe it the first time i was so I had no idea what to expect going into it. And I just remember feeling like my whole body was so relaxed, but then also like vibrating everywhere. Like I was just feeling so much and I didn't know how to explain it. But the next day when I woke up, it was at night. So the next day when I woke up, I just felt a tiny bit lighter. I was like, okay, I'm going to try this again and do this again. And I finally had realized how little space I gave myself to just exist and turn my brain off and focus on the present, focus on the sounds I'm hearing, focus on myself. Mm -hmm. And when you've never done that before, it can feel a little overwhelming, but it's such an amazing, amazing experience and feeling for the first time focusing on you. Mm. Yeah, that, that's beautiful. And I do, I think that the, the, there is no barrier for entry to a sound bath. I've worked with a lot of different kinds of people of all ages and interests and nationalities and physical abilities, uh, you know, you, you name it across all industries. Um, and I, I, I feel that whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you come from, that you can show up as you are in the experience of a sound bath. It gives you permission to simply be as you are, which a lot of people don't have the opportunity to, you know, to do that. And it can feel really powerful. Absolutely. And I'm just like amazed with how balanced and kind of that sense of self that you have, that's something that I'm constantly working on and trying to develop. How did you get where you, where you are? <laughs> so it's interesting. I, I always think of, not that I, I, I walk around in my life quoting Steve Jobs, but he gave, he did give a really interesting uh, graduation speech. Uh, it's, it's like, it's up on YouTube somewhere where he talks about all the different jobs he had before Apple and how I, I don't forget exactly, but how he studied calligraphy um, in college and had all these like different kinds of interests. And 
when he was going through those stages of life, you know, didn't really know where he was going to end up. But looking back, you can see very clearly how all of these things informed each other. And I, I really think about that in my life too. Uh, if I look back, uh, sound and music have always played an important role in my life from the time I was a child. Um, I, I made music, I listened to music, I performed. Um, and when my, when I was very, very young, my oldest sister, um, she was, she suffered from a, a terminal illness. And at one point in her illness, she was non-communicative, but we, we would play music for her, her favorite songs, her favorite bands, and there would be a, a, a shift in her eyes. You could see that she was aware. And I think that really, really stayed with me as I explored my work as an artist and as a musician. And I was always fascinated about that effect um, that sound had. And I started to create artwork. I'm just giving you these little markers of my life because I feel like they're really important, um, kind of pivotal moments. And then when I was creating artwork and mixed media installations in my, my studio, I was 23 years old, which is a while ago now. And <laughs> the floor collapsed in my studio. And so from that fall, I suffered from a broken back in four places um, and temporary paralysis, which you would think wouldn't be like a highlight of my life that I would be sharing with you now. However, it, it really was because it, it reset me in a different kind of direction to explore a, a new relationship with my body and with my mind because I was forced to. And I think a lot of, a lot of the best um, healers and practitioners um, are that way because they had to go through their own process of recovering from trauma or injury or, or adversity or some, something like that, right? Those, those are always like the best stories, right? <laughs> because, because you're faced with something that's really intense and, and we all are, you know, it's so, so we all have our unique challenges in life and it, it's not about what happens to us, but what we choose to do in the face of that. And so ultimately I became a meditation teacher and I studied massage therapy and traditional Chinese medicine and uh, became a Reiki master and all these different things that felt very separate actually from my artist and musician self until I kind of came back around to that earlier self and said, oh, hey, where is this person? Where is the artist musician person? I miss that person. And eventually I started to merge all of those things, all of those interests to say, oh, I can create something that is musical, that is creative. I can design a space and an experience that's inviting to people um, where they can participate. Um, and I can use all of this knowledge that I have in my studies in physiology, kinesiology, neuroscience, and, you know, all these uh, psychoacoustics and all these other things. So that, that was it for me. <laughs> I mean, I know that was a, That's it. It was a long winded way to get there, but, but you say it's like, I think for me to answer your question a little bit more simply, how do I get to be this way? 
um, that I would interpret you saying as uh, maybe embodied or uh, confident in who I am and those types of things. It, it, it's acknowledging all the different sides of myself and not trying to hide any any part of it in the work that I do and 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 just honoring you know that kid who used to love to draw and I still love to design things and just acknowledging all of my my interests and helps me to feel comfortable what a journey I mean in the face of so much adversity a lot of people would just crumble or just kind of lose a lot of hope or just disconnect from themselves completely and never find that connection and you really took all of it and turned it into ways kind of to connect deeper to yourself to support yourself to grow more and more into who you are and who you're meant to be and then to use that to help others and help others do the same is completely I don't even have the words. It's so incredible. I am so appreciative of you and your journey and how you're using it to really help others. Well, I hope that what you see in me is something that you see in yourself because what you do is quite similar. And I, I hope that whoever's listening can also reflect on that and think, you know, what challenging thing have, have I had to overcome and, 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 and have I, have I been through it and how did I get through it and how can I help someone else get through it using what I know, having been on the dark side or having been at this low point um how did i manage to get out and how can i impart that that wisdom to somebody else or extend a hand to somebody else um i think that that's the that's the best way to to sort of pay it forward and that it, it you know not to over glamorize the, the story there were certain there was certainly a very very low point where i was not inspired to do anything <laughs> Let's not like leave out the ugly parts, <laughs> you know, uh, slightly addicted to morphine and painkillers, you know, but knowing that I, that there had to be an, another way as skeptical as I was. And so as I started to kind of climb out of there and I realized these certain practices and other types of modalities were helping me as a skeptic I felt okay well if these actually work or they're actually helping me I need to be able to or I know I can rather communicate to other people who might be a little bit judgmental like me who might be a little cynical or closed-minded like me uh, because I was and I would with my arms crossed and eyes rolling, drag myself to yoga and be like, I hate every second of this, <laughs> but it helped me, you know? And so I felt like almost a responsibility to become a, a communicator of these types of practices. That's incredible. I mean, at that point, when I was at that point myself, where I just like, no hope, no desire to even try anymore. And then just not thinking anything's going to work and not knowing where to start. I mean, not knowing what modalities are like options for me was I think the hardest part of just not knowing where to start, what to do, what my options were. How did you kind of figure out what to try first? Hmm. Well, I was lucky enough um, because when I was released after a couple of weeks from the hospital, I had a walker and a back brace from my hips up to my neck. And the neurosurgeon told me, 
you know, okay, you're good to go. And I said, what do you mean I'm good to go? I can hardly walk. Do you like give me physical therapy or how does this work? I asked. I luckily had a little bit of sense to be somewhat of an advocate for myself. And he said, oh yeah, yeah. You want a prescription for physical therapy? Uh, sure, here. And he takes out his pad and he writes it. And I was like, so anything else is there? something I should be doing or not doing. I mean, I just broke my back. I couldn't feel my legs for a little while. Like, what do you think? And he said, if it hurts, don't do it. <laughs> Amazing advice. So helpful. Amazing advice. Okay. So everything hurts. And I was lucky enough to have a friend who recommended I go see a chiropractor. And at first I was really nervous because what I thought a chiropractor did at the time was just like crack backs. And that was like, that was terrifying to me. I didn't want my back cracked, but she said, no, 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 no. It's a holistic approach. And she has an acupuncturist there and a physical therapist there. Just go talk to her. And I met with this woman, Ruth Fernandez, I'll never forget. And she sat with me for two hours and my 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 family came with me i had like an entourage and she showed me my x-rays and she said here's the you know two-week plan here's the three-month plan here's what we're going to be doing in a year she put me on a cleanse she was like she didn't touch my back you know she she looked at my circumstances and gave me a plan that included acupuncture and massage and e-stim and all these things. And I felt like, wow, what a different experience from that neurosurgeon, um, you know, and, 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 and not to put down neurosurgeons. I have a cousin who's a neurosurgeon. So it was just it was that particular one that gave me poor advice or advice that I didn't like, um, but it was like night and day. And just to have that feeling to know that there was somebody out there who could just like see my see my circumstances and listen. And then from that I, I started to try different things as per her recommendation and the recommendation of my physical therapist and I tried a lot of things I didn't like and I learned what it meant to have a crappy practitioner and like have a massage that was not great or to be more vocal and more of an advocate for myself as a patient and as a client to say, yeah, hey, that that's like a little too hard, that pressure or like, no, thanks. I don't want adjustments in class. And I learned through also through like not such great experiences how to speak up for myself and to ask more for what I wanted and you know, it's just still an ongoing <laughs> exploration. I, I have a team of people who care for my mind and body. <laughs> oh, I love that. I mean, that is such an important lesson that unfortunately we're all going to have bad experiences sometimes with practitioners or just different situations. And that doesn't mean that it doesn't work for us or that we're hopeless or that we're helpless. It just means that maybe it's not the right person for you, or you need to speak up and tell them to let them know, to make your voice heard. And a lot of us, at least in my experience, often shy away from speaking up for ourselves because it's so much easier to just have that automatic thought in my mind that, oh, it's just me. Yeah, and I think sometimes it's unfair to generalize an entire field, just like, you know, you wouldn't say like, let's say you had a bad slice of pizza or something and you wouldn't say, well, I tried pizza once and I didn't like it. So I'm never going to have pizza again. <laughs> you something, something like that. And people do that with, um, with practitioners, with meditation. I tried meditating once and I didn't like it. I didn't like her voice. I didn't let you know, and, and they just kind of write it off without saying, oh, well, there's there's levels to it. And there's, uh, you know, di different qualifiers of teachers and practitioners. And so it's important as a 
student, as a patient, as a client to, to do some research about the person that you're going to and feel comfortable to ask them questions, especially if you have a particular thing that you're working on, whether it's mental or physical that you could feel comfortable to say, you know, this is what's going on. Do you have experience working with people with that? Let that have, you know, have a conversation. Exactly. Exactly. Don't give up on yourself. Advocate for yourself. Don't be afraid to ask questions. I mean, there's so many things you may not even just know or understand, and it's okay to ask. It doesn't, I know for me, like a doctor would say something, and I didn't know what it was, and I wouldn't ask. And I was like, oh, I'm just like dumb or something, and wrote it off. And in reality, I just didn't know, never heard the terminology before. And if I had asked, I would have felt so much more comfortable and gotten the support and help I needed at the time. But I was afraid to just ask. So never be afraid to ask questions, to speak up, to try new things. You like you deserve it. We all deserve the chance to feel better. Yeah. And I would I would also say uh, like a little piece of advice too is if it if it know your boundaries of course but if something feels a little bit uncomfortable uh see if you can see if you can do it again as long as it feels safe uh for me i know that 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 was a threshold that i crossed with a lot of different practices um the first couple of times i experienced um sounds healing actually um it was not enjoyable to me uh and not only was it not enjoyable it was more like yeah i don't really like this and this is what i don't like about it um and i didn't feel great about it but i said you know i i i get the concept and i think i want to try it again with a different person and you know so just just being open and, and curious enough to keep exploring. Yes, yes. Explore your options, give yourself a chance. And one thing I love that you said was recognizing why you didn't like it that first time. Because a lot of times you often say, oh, I don't like this, but we don't take the time to explore why. And if we don't explore why, we can't adjust it right? Like, oh, I don't like this pizza. Why don't I like it? Maybe the sauce wasn't good. (laughs) Okay. So that's not the pizza was the sauce. So figuring out why you didn't like it and maybe finding an option that works better for you, because there's so many different teachers out there who can, who do it differently, who offer just something a little different that might work for you and what you need. Yeah, maybe you're just not in the mood for pizza. Like, that's the other thing, too, is, you know, we are very complex beings and every day we're going to show up differently. And there are so many variables for that. How much we slept the night before, uh, if we got into a uh, an argument with a loved one or, you know, it's like, all of these things affect us on many different levels. And so when we show up to an experience when or when we show up to the pizza it could be us too and the pizza's fine (laughs) (laughs) so you have to kind of remember that um and be gentle with yourself uh with that too as you kind of explore these options absolutely sarah you have just been the most amazing vessel of honestly like calmness and inspiration I am so happy you joined me today thank you so much oh thanks I love talking to you friend thank you so much for listening to normalize the conversation don't forget to subscribe rate and review this podcast is an initiative of inspiring my generation focusing on normalizing the conversation bringing education and awareness to the forefront and amplifying global voices to spark change and hope. Inspiring My Generation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization 
on a mission towards suicide prevention through awareness, conversation, education, and support. Connect with us on Instagram at Inspiring My Generation and visit our website, inspiringmygeneration.org to learn more about our work and how you can make a difference.